We are in the midst of a series that is reflecting on a very important principle in Scripture. And it's been interesting. We're two weeks in, and I don't remember the last time a sermon series has generated so much conversation or so much pushback uh, as this one. And the premise, before I kind of give away the lead here, is what I've been saying for the last couple weeks of why we're entering into this particular study of this principle of Scripture is because we live at a time, perhaps more than any other, where busy is the default status of so many people. You ask people how they are, they say they're busy. In the age of multitasking, increased mobility, global networks, working nine to five is a thing of the past. As you'll see on the next slide, we can and do go, go, go around the clock, always bringing our work home with us, even with us on vacation. And I know that many of you have pushed back, though I addressed this in the first sermon and said, well, I'm retired, so that doesn't apply to me. So I want you to look at this slide and notice very carefully how it describes the first three phases of retirement. Go, go, slow go, and no go. (laughs) The deeper meaning of this very simplistic slide is you're expected to go, go, even when you retire, until you can't go, until it's no go. Until it's not that you don't want to keep going, you physically, mentally, emotionally can't keep going. That's not a healthy model. And if you're retired, guess what? And and I've talked to many of you and you've acknowledged this. You're retired. But isn't it amazing how quickly you fill up all that free time with stuff to do? Home projects to complete, various activities and appointments to manage, trips to plan, maybe loved ones to care for. And so all of a sudden you go, yeah, I'm retired, but I'm really busy. And then, of course, there are our smartphones. And most everyone has one of these little babies. And with our smartphones never leaving our hands, we've actually created devices so they can actually go between your fingers and just actually become a part of your hand. (laughs) Americans check their phones on an average of 12 minutes, every 12 minutes. So that means I'm going to be seeing you checking your phone a lot. That's 80 times a day. And that means, in other words, we're always within reach of someone or something. We're always within reach of the sound of a call, the ping of a text, an alert, an update, a headline, something demanding our attention. We are always on and we are never off. Some of us, as I mentioned earlier in this series, don't even know how to be off, how to stop anymore. And so the repeated theme is we are overworked, we are overscheduled, we are overcommitted, we are getting less sleep, we have more stress. It's all work and no play. And it's turning us, as the next slide will show you, into ticking time bombs. It's no longer a question of if, it is simply a matter of when the overload, the crash, the meltdown, the burnout comes. And if anyone considers this assessment that I'm repeating a lot to be an overreaction, I just want to show you two recent headlines. One that was sent to me by a member of this community. Notice some of the most more recent news reports. This is from this week in the Orange County Register. Look at the headline. 50% of office workers in Los Angeles and Orange County say they're severely burnt out. The worst in the United States. That's from this week. And then just a couple of months back, look at this article from BuzzFeed. How millennials became the burnout generation. The burnout generation, the generation that before they've reached their peak, they're already burned out. That's why we're here. That's why for these next couple of weeks, we are focusing, we're exploring, we're seeking to practice a totally different orientation, a rhythm of living given to us by God that counters the frantic and ceaseless pace by which we so often exist. It's the rhythm of not working first, And then maybe, perhaps, if we get to it, resting later. But instead, it's resting from our work. It's resting in order to work, something that's known biblically as the Sabbath. Today, we're going to seek to better understand and appreciate this alternative way of living, of resting the Sabbath, through Israel's story, through Israel's emergence as a people and eventually as a nation. And right from the start today, what we're going to discover is the gift of rest given to us by God is more than just a rhythm. It's also a law. 
And why that is, why it's a law, and how that, what that should mean for us in terms of how we engage the Sabbath, that's going to be our focus this morning. Now, the thing is, the Sabbath is codified as a rule of life, not once, but twice in the story of Israel's journey to the promised land. And the first time you're going to hear about it, and it's on the screen, you don't have to turn in your Bibles, is in Exodus chapter 20. And we're going to read, I'm going to read this for you real quick and then unpack it a little bit. And it reads, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. The next slide reads, on it you shall do not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your town. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So right here in Exodus, we see God codifying a rhythm that he's already built into creation, built into our DNA. Why does, if he's built it into creation, into our DNA, why does he have to make this rhythm into a law? Because if you didn't know where this was from, this rhythm of the Sabbath has become a rule of life. It, this, is from part of, this is part of God's top 10 rules for life, known as the Ten Commandments. So Israel here, right as they get into the wilderness, right at the foot of Mount Sinai, is reminded of something that we looked at last week. Israel's reminded that for six days God spoke all life into being. With each breath, you'll remember declaring, it's good. But creation was finished with the setting apart of a day, the seventh day, as a sacred space dedicated to rest in the awareness of not just it is good, but that life is good. Practicing the Sabbath is one of God's top 10 rules for life because this rhythm of regular and repeated rest reflected through the seasons and patterns of nature is fundamental and essential to our flourishing to being and becoming all that God created us to be. The Sabbath as a day, as a pocket of space, is not for nothing. And we're going to keep talking about this because many of you have pushed back. Is the Sabbath just about doing nothing? And if you didn't hear me last week, hear me now. The Sabbath is not for nothing. To rest is not a lack of activity. What God is calling us to is the absence of work, of labor. And God's calling that for once in seven days for all people. And if you think that's a waste of time, the way God unpacks it for us, we talked about this last week, you're gonna hear it more today, to rest is not a waste of time. It's the gift of dedicated time to delight, to reflect upon, to celebrate, to be renewed by the Lord's provision, the work that God has done, and to anticipate the ongoing blessings of God, the work that God promises to do in and through us. One of the things I want you to notice here in Exodus is this key word, the key word that God uses here to present the Sabbath, and it's highlighted for you, the word remember. Why does God call Israel to remember the Sabbath when supposedly this rhythm of rest is hardwired into our DNA? Because if you don't remember where we are in terms of this part of the story, Israel as a people, as a community, has lost their sense of rhythm. They've lost their sense of rhythm. In the centuries, more than 400 years of living under the thumb of Egypt in bondage, another rhythm has been drilled into them. And do you remember what that rhythm was like as it's described to us in the book of Exodus? The other rhythm that's been drilled into them is the rhythm of ceaseless labor, of constantly working in order to survive, working constantly in order to see another day. Under Egyptian rule, You keep working or you die. You keep working or you die. But now, after more than 400 years, newly liberated from the yoke of the Egyptian way, God here in the wilderness teaches his children his way. The Lord, via his top 10, spells out his rules for life, the way things are supposed to be, the way the world was created to work how we were intended to engage and treat each other. With the rule of the Sabbath, the Lord explicitly calls out something inherent in his design plan, an innate rhythm built into creation that we forget, that we need to rest regularly. Now, 
Again, based upon some of the commentary after the sermons that, that have gone so far, some of the, and it's been really good conversation, and I love it. I, I, I can anticipate some of the pushback already. But we're not like the Israelites back then. We haven't lived most of our lives under the domination of a foreign power. This is the land of the free and the home of the brave. We don't really need to learn the way of the Sabbath like they did. It's not how we're used to living, Pastor Chris. I've heard that a lot. This is just not how we're used to living. And if we're honest, this whole Sabbath thing seems kind of archaic, let alone logistically impossible. And if I'm really, really honest, and some people have said this, the Sabbath, what you're saying God has given us this opportunity, it seems kind of self-indulgent. With this mentality in mind, this idea that this doesn't apply to us, that that was then and this is now, now I invite you to look at the book of Deuteronomy, which you're open to, chapter 5. And let me set the stage for this book for you before we read it. The fifth book in the Bible, Deuteronomy, represents Moses' final teachings to the people of Israel as they stand on the verge of finally entering the promised land. And if you don't remember this, it's been a 40-year journey to get from the book of Exodus to Deuteronomy. It's a 40-year journey, not because it takes 40 years geographically to get from where they were to where they needed to be. No, this extended duration of time of 40 years, if you don't remember it, is because the first generation of Israelites has been unwilling to learn the lessons God has been trying to teach them about his way of life. Therefore, when we read these words in Deuteronomy, the focus of Moses' instruction on behalf of the Lord is the next generation. The children of Israel who grew up in the wilderness watching their parents painfully flunk out of school. Addressing the future of Israel, Moses once again repeats the building blocks of the Torah, the law, the way, God's top 10 rules for life, for living as God intended, which of course, as you're gonna see, includes laying out one more time the rule of the Sabbath. But here's what I want you to do as you see it on the screen, as you read it in your Bible, listen carefully for how this command to rest is expressed the same as it was in Exodus, as we just looked at, and yet also a little bit differently as well. So here it is. God says, observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but on the seventh day it is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall do no work, neither you nor your servant or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your ox or your donkey, or any of your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns, so that your male and female servants may rest as you do. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. And this is the word of the Lord. There's a key word repeated here, and it's highlighted for you now. Did you catch it? Key word we heard before, remember. Except this time, remember isn't just linked to the Sabbath, but remember is linked to not forgetting as a people that they once were enslaved in Egypt. Remember that you were once slaves. But here's the thing. Remember what I just told you. Notice the Lord speaks this way to the next generation, the new generation of Israelites. But they weren't slaves in Egypt. Their parents were. And yet God here frames it as if they were there, as if they were once in bondage. Because here's the thing. They were. Because this was their heritage. This is where they came from. This is what they, the Lord brought their parents and by extension them out of. And so God says remember because if they forget where they've come from, if they forget what their parents' lives were like apart from God, then they're going to end up back in the very same place. They're going to end up in slavery. And beloved, so will we. We have to remember where we've come from. We have to remember who we once were apart from God, who we are without God in our lives. Because like the Israelites, like all who've gone before us, we are easily distracted and forgetful. 
We are easily distracted and forgetful of what we've been given, of where we've come from, of whose we are. And this is where it gets real. This is where it gets personal because how easy is it? How easy is it for us to lose our God-given sense of rest? How easy is it for us? How easy have we lost that rhythm, that God-given sense of rest, and instead have had drilled into us a different beat, a false measure, a corrupting pace of life? You don't believe me? You think I'm crazy? Consider the primary narrative that drives our lives. The primary narrative that drives your life and mine is we are what we do. Ours is a world, and let's be honest, that views work as an end in and of itself. What we earn, what we achieve, what we accomplish creates our identity and gives meaning to our lives. You ever notice this? One of the first questions we ask someone, it may not be the first, but one of the first questions we ask someone when we meet is, what do you do? Think about that. We never ask, who are you? You never go up to someone and go, who are you? You go, what do you do? You don't ask, who are you? Because we've internalized who, what you do is who you are. What you do is who you are. It goes deeper than that. All of us, and I'm going to really push and get some buttons right now. I'm just preparing you. Some of you are going to get mad at me. We have been raised, you and I, we have been raised to value hard work, raised to value hard work, raised to value hard work in order to be somebody, in order to go anywhere in this world. We teach our children, the harder you work, the more you will succeed in life. And we reinforce this lesson daily by rewarding others when they are productive and pushing, maybe even scolding others who don't measure up. And this relentless drive to produce only intensifies as we make our way through high school, then into college, to graduate school, then into the job market, and then once you have a job, it's from the first rung of the corporate ladder all the way to that elusive brass ring at the top. More work. Less rest, that's the ticket to maximizing success. That's the ticket to wealth, power, and influence. Having more, doing more, is being more. But you're only as good as your last deal. You're only as good as your latest accomplishment in the constant drive to prove ourselves and keep up, our work is never done. We have the means. We have the technology to work around the clock and across the calendar. We have sayings, the early bird gets the worm, right? The last one out of the office is the first one to get promoted. Taking a little time off, let alone the notion of taking a substantial time of regular intentional rest, is foreign to our corporate culture. It goes against our gut instincts. If your boss expects you to respond to her email on a Sunday, what choice do you have? If your clients need your attention after hours, are you really going to risk losing their business? It's career suicide. Besides, if you can't hack it, there's always someone else who's willing to take your place. Do we even recognize how much all of this sounds like the way of life for the Israelites under Egyptian rule? You work or you die. You work until you die. Our version's a little softer. It's a little different. We say things like this, as you'll see on the next slide. I'll sleep when I'm dead. Or I'll rest when I'm retired. Do you know how ironic these sayings are? I'll sleep when I'm dead. You sure will. (laughs) You'll rest when you're retired. Yes, you will. I'm pushing buttons, but our entire narrative that we've, which our lives have been based, which we pass on to our children is not the biblical narrative. How easily 
we assume we have the kind of control over our lives where we'll rest when we're dead. We'll stop when we're retired. And again, you want to know another symptom of how deeply embedded this is, and I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but those of you who are retired, how many of you struggled to retire? How many of you struggled when you didn't have as much to do? How, much, how many of you struggled when your identity was no longer your job title? When you didn't have all those people working over you, under you, when you didn't have things that you could point to, accomplishes, sales that you closed, deals that you made, things that you did. How many of you, therefore, in retirement, have come up with tons of stuff to do so you can justify you matter, you exist. You come up with project after project. You fill your life so that your life looks full because if you're not doing something, then you're not somebody. That is not the biblical narrative. Now, I know I'm pushing buttons, and I know that some of us, again, because this is so ingrained, are like, so what, what is the point here, Pastor? What's the point? God doesn't want us to work. God doesn't want us to work hard. God doesn't want us to be productive. Absolutely not. That is not what I'm saying to you this morning. Work is a gift from God. We're created to work. Go back to Genesis. We're created and told to fill and care for the earth, to be fruitful and multiply. We're created to discover, explore, and to create. We are created for work. The Lord calls us each in his or her own God-given way to contribute to the health and well-being of all creation. The work of our hands, our hearts, our minds is one of the primary means by which we fulfill our true purpose to glorify God to serve the common good, to be ambassadors for the kingdom of God. The Lord gives us specific gifts and opportunities, strengths, skills, talents, capacities, in order to enable us to work, to live out our calling, to do the work to which he has called us. Yes, of course, God understands that taking care of a family, living into one's job, vocation, using our gifts and abilities takes effort and means time. Here's the thing. The Lord also knows that having the time and taking the time to rest is an essential part of all those things being able to happen in a healthy and balanced way. When we ignore, when we push past the cadences that God has instilled within our bodies, as we deny the inherent rhythm of life the Lord reflects to us through all creation, as we seek to become the pharaohs of our own lives, the truth is we run the risk of becoming enslaved to our own ego, enslaved to our own selfish ambition and just self-centeredness in our hunger and pursuit of power, wealth, fame, and pleasure on our own terms and apart from God, our work, our job will become our idol. It will become what we live for. It will become what we worship, what dominates our time, our attention, and our energy. And beloved, to have our identity derived from what we do, for our purpose to be defined by what we accomplish or achieve or earn, is to be enslaved to our work. When our job, our work becomes our idol, our job, our work will become oppressive. It will become hurtful. It will become dehumanizing. It will harden our hearts. It will crush our souls. When we idolize our work, we will inevitably enslave others in our drive to succeed as people soon become nameless and faceless numbers and statistics. But you know this, those of you who are workaholics, you know this who've looked into the abyss, you know what I'm about to say. And those of you who haven't, you know that one day you will look in this abyss and yet you're still driving yourself like this. For all we gain in money, power, and influence, making work our job, our idol, for all we gain in money, power, and influence, we lose everything for which we are working. We lose our family, we lose our friends, we lose our community. Pastorly, I cannot tell you how many people I have come alongside whose marriages have fallen apart, whose families have been broken, 
whose communities have become unsettled because someone's just not there. Not there physically, not there mentally, not there emotionally, not there spiritually, because they are bowing down to the job. And I hear it all the time. If I'm confessing to you before I was a pastor, it was my mantra too. You just don't understand. I'm working this hard and I'm working this long because it's going to all be worth it in the end. Once I get there, once I reach this level, everything's going to be great. Everything's going to be different. And the reality is it never changes. Never changes. We can all sit here and say, you know, God doesn't need to make a rule to tell us to slow down and rest because on our own, we can figure out that we need to stop every once in a while. Really? God doesn't need to give us a rule? I beg to differ. Everything that we just talked about at the start of the sermon, everything that just keeps getting reported to us is we clearly know we need to stop, but we don't know how to stop. We know we need to rest, but we won't give ourselves permission to rest. And so God finally has to say, I'm sorry, this isn't just an invitation, it's a command. Stop, rest, chill out. Make no mistake, (laughs) make no mistake, in a world that's addicted to the twin drugs of accomplishment and accumulation, the spirit of Pharaoh and his empire are alive and well. You don't just have to read the Bible about this impulse in human history. Let's do a little little history lesson for a second. October 23rd, 1793. That's just nine days after Queen Marie Antoinette was executed. You know what happened on that day? Viva la France, the French Revolution. The Republican calendar was created, decreed as the law of the land in France. And this calendar reform was an attempt to keep with the French Revolution's stated goal of promoting reason as opposed to faith. Reason. And so what happened with this new Republican calendar? Months were renamed. Weeks were declared to be 10 days instead of seven days long. These new weeks were named decades. The biggest implication of these changes, if you haven't caught it yet, is that the weekend only came about every 10 days. Workers were given one day off in 10 rather than one day off in seven. Can you imagine what happened? Suicide rates skyrocketed. Public health severely declined. Frustration mounted. People, it's reported, and even horses were physically unable to cope with ignoring God's law of one day of rest in seven. Within 12 years during the reign of Napoleon, this new calendar was shortly abandoned as, surprise, surprise, unworkable. My friends, when we lose our God-given sense of rhythm for Sabbath, for rest, we will inevitably force others to march to the beat of our drum. Or we will end up finding ourselves keeping time to someone else's clock. But this is not the way it's supposed to be. You and I, we're not beasts of burden. You know that. We are not beasts of burden. From God's perspective, life without work is meaningless. Yes, from God's perspective, life without work is meaningless. But work must never become the meaning of one's life. We are not the job. Have you ever said that? I'm the job. We are not the job. Our career is not who we are. What you do is not who you are. We do not live to work. We are designed to be human beings. We were created. We have been redeemed to be human beings, not human doings. It is not our work that sustains us or gives our lives meaning. Do you know that? And ask yourself how you, when you reflect, it is not your work that gives your life meaning or value. We're here, you're here because we profess to believe. We profess that we live, move, and have our being in our creator, in the one who cast us in his image. Our lives do not depend upon our jobs, our paychecks, our upward mobility, or any other material thing. Do you know that? If your job changes, if your pay gets decreased, if you're not climbing up, If something that you've labored so long to possess is no longer yours, is your whole world shattered? Are you shattered? Because the reality is your life does not depend on any of those things. Late breaking newsflash, 
any of that stuff. Your job, your paycheck, your, whatever your position title is, and all the stuff that you buy with the job that you work so hard in isn't going with you. Your treasure is going to become someone else's trash. My friends, this life and the life still to come alone and depend and find their f- fulfillment in the one who came down in the flesh of humanity to set us free from our enslavement, our enslavement to having to be more, to do more, to get more in order to justify our existence, in order to make our na- a name for ourselves beyond the grave. I'm amazed at the number of Christians, professed followers of Christ who are afraid to die who are afraid to die and are so obsessed with what their legacy is going to be, what they're going to leave behind. Are people going to remember them? Are people going to remember what they did? Are people going to remember who they were? And the evidence of this is when someone passes away and you see how they pass on this obsession that we are what we do, we are what we have, when the family goes to war over the estate. The classic litigation of that's mine, not yours. That if I don't have that, then I'm not loved as much my mom or dad as you are. That if you have more than I have, then I am less of who a part of this family. It is crazy. Guys, our lives depend. Our lives are given meaning. We find our purpose in the God who creates and redeems us. But we forget all of this. We forget the truth of the gospel on a regular basis. We're so forgetful. And maybe part of the reason is because we address Jesus as our Lord, but really we look to Jesus more like our lifeguard. You know, Jesus is our lifeguard. You can picture a lifeguard, right? Jesus is our lifeguard. He minds the body of water while we swim. He just minds the body of water while we swim, however, wherever, and as long as we want. Never mind the depths of the waters. Pay no attention to the current or the tide. Ignore the warning songs, signs along the beach. Jesus, just sit there and look pretty while I swim however I want in this body of water. It's only when we start to sink, it's only when we're drowning that we look to Jesus and follow his lead. Help! But here's the thing. If salvation is just about God rescuing us, if salvation is just about God getting us out of a jam, then once we're free and clear, of course we're quickly going to go back to living our lives the way we want rather than following his way. Thanks, Jesus, for pulling me out of that one. Go back to your chair. I'll let you know if I need you. You do know this. The Lord wants us to understand what the Lord is trying to teach us is that he isn't simply our lifeguard pulling us out of the water before we nearly drown. God is our swimming instructor, teaching us how to swim so that we don't get in over our heads, so that we don't exhaust ourselves laboring against the current, so that we can navigate and glide through the waters of life, getting stronger, going farther with each shore we reach. And that's why God tells us to Remember the Sabbath. Remember, observe. These words are synonymous. To remember is more than a mental act. It's more than not just forgetting. To remember is to meditate upon. It's to think through and consider the implications of something. The Hebrew word observe here, like remember, is active and not passive. It's not to observe in the sense of a casual glance or a nod of our head in acknowledgement. We're not to observe the Sabbath like we might watch a sunset or a performance. To observe in this context is to keep watch. It's to guard something like a soldier. It's to pay attention by exercising great care over it. To observe is to give due diligence to every detail of the focus of our attention. In other words, to observe the Sabbath is not just to know that the Lord calls us to rest. It is to enter into that rest. The Sabbath is the gift of time and space that God sets apart so that we can remember and observe the glory of creation and the truth of salvation, that we did not make ourselves, that we are not saved or sustained by ourselves, but only through his grace. The thing is, making the Sabbath the rule of life is not fundamentally about God's ego. It's about his design plan. The Lord knows what's best for us because God designed to us to function to be our best. 
And God designed us to rest. More specifically, God designed us to rest in him. Something distinctive that I talked about last week that I'm going to repeat because it was still hard for people to get their head around. Something distinctive about the rhythm and rule of Sabbath is this. In the beginning, God works first, setting all creation in motion and then rests. As we described it, he delights in his handiwork. But here's the thing. We as a part of God's creation begin where God ends. The Sabbath, the seventh day, is our first day from which all the other six days flow. In other words, we don't work in order to rest. We rest in order to work. And for many of us, again, this is the exact opposite of how we think about it. But here's why that's so important. Practicing the Sabbath, resting in the Lord, is not time or space for us to do something for God. No, it is time and space God sets apart to do something for us. As we rest in the Lord as our starting point, as we abide and delight in what God has done and what God will do, what God is doing, the strength and the assurance of the Lord becomes the engine that powers our lives to engage the work to which he calls us. That's why that order is so important, to rest in God in order to work. But as we're closing this out, I've, <laughs> I've had a couple of conversations and, and it's been real. You may, you know, you, we hear this and we may wonder how can we possibly heed a rule of life based on God's cycle of work and rest and still be able to make it in today's modern economy? How can we possibly hold a job or maybe two or three? How can we clean the house? How can we prepare the meals? How can we mow the lawn? How can we wash the car? How can we pay the bills? How can we finish the schoolwork and all the other stuff we have to get done if we take a day off during the course of the week? Is God going to put food on my table? Is God going to pay my bills? Is God going to get it all done for me? Here's what I can tell you. Here's what I tell myself. The Lord doesn't explain how he will provide for us. The Lord simply tells us to rest one day out of every seven. And the Lord elsewhere repeatedly assures us and provides time after time that if we follow his rules for life, he can and he does provide everything we need. Maybe not everything we want, but everything we need. And so what I'm here to tell you is practicing the rhythm, the rule of Sabbath, as it, as, as it is true of any aspects of our relationship with God, it's a matter of faith and trust. It's a matter of faith and trust. But here's the thing, it doesn't matter where, where you live, it doesn't matter what you do, it doesn't matter how old or young, rich or poor you are, there's no getting around, the Sabbath is a rule of life. And just in case any of us are still wondering, or maybe if any of us want to argue that the rule of Sabbath isn't relevant or applicable to us today, let me ask you this. Does anyone want to argue that God's other rules for life, say commandments against killing or committing adultery or lying are not applicable, applicable or relevant today. Does anyone want to say, you know what, that's how passe. Killing's fine. Adultery, great. Lying, no problem. Anybody else want to say, you know, these are outdated? Of course not. So then why has the Sabbath commandment, which by the way is numbered before all of those, why has that become an optional extra for us? Last week, I encouraged you to step into this, and we're going to keep easing into this. I encourage you to focus on your breathing. I revealed to you that most of us don't breathe properly. I encourage you to just try to breathe for 10 or 15 minutes, three times a day, intentionally taping, taking those deep cleansing breaths. Did anybody actually try that? Can I see a show of hands? And for those of you who didn't, your loss. <laughs> it is. It's your loss. You keep doing what you do. Eventually, your breath will catch up with you. I would encourage you, if you didn't practice it, or if you did, to keep doing it. And for those of you who did, did you notice a difference? Did, it, did you notice something just in that brief experience? And so I'm going to add something more. For those of you who didn't do it, do your homework. <laughs> Breathe properly. But here's what I want to encourage you. If a whole day of rest still seems impossible to you, and I know for some of you that's just overwhelming, here's what I want to leave you with. I want to challenge you to pick a day and designate four hours as Sabbath time. Four hours out of 24. Saturday morning from 8 a.m. to noon. What about it? 
And if I'm sitting here saying, hey, I just want you to take four hours and you're going, I can't possibly find four hours for this, then you need Sabbath more than you realize. For four hours, you thinking about when? Four hours, turn off your phone. I actually said it, turn off your phone. Close your computer. Put down the laundry. Unplug from your work. Whatever you need to do to unplug from your work. For four hours, dedicate that time to something in which you delight. What was scary to me last week is how many people, when I said Sabbath is about doing something you delight in, said, I don't know what I delight in. Okay, take four hours to figure it out. (laughs) Figure it out. Figure out and enter for four hours into something in which you delight, something in which you can share and be mindful of God in the midst of enjoying. Invite others to join you, if that sounds restful. But in those four hours, reflect, laugh, daydream, count your blessings, eat, drink, and be merry. And through it all, again, acknowledge the presence of Jesus. Because here's the thing, I'm convinced, and boy, I want to see a better show of hands next week, but I'm convinced if you enter that four hours, honestly, openly, and authentically, the benefits of that brief period of time will lead you not to to stop resisting or questioning the rule of Sabbath, but I believe if you enter into those four hours, honestly, openly, and authentically, you will actually find yourself hungering for more of it. You will want to expand its presence in terms of your daily life, and you will begin to have a taste of how God designed you, how God commands you, how God longs for you to operate. Because, my friends, rest is not a reward. Rest is a gift. Rest is not a reward. It's a necessity. It's a rule of life of living like the Israelites into our own exodus, out of our own freedom, found in our relationship with the God who gives us the glorious release of dedicated time and space in which we can enjoy each other as well as know and be at peace with ourselves. It is resting in the power of the Lord, his provision and his providence. It's trusting that just as God in Christ has taken care of all we have needed to bring us this far, that God will continue to provide and lead us home. I invite you for four hours to enter into that space, that time. Amen.